Well, welcome back again to what I uh, hope will be a wrap-up video on the Regal MSO 5000 series that we've been at for some some time now. Uh, this is the uh, set of videos that comprises the series. The, uh, the original plan was put forward in number 367 and we've been through these various subjects I'll slide it up here to the very last one, which is Logic Analyzers, which was number 396. So looks like about looks like about 30 videos, and this one will be the uh, 30th or 31st, and and hopefully the last. You may recall that we started out doing this with the idea of the suitability and use of the Regal MSO 5000 in embedded systems. And we're going to talk about the uh, a set of issues that uh, we have previously covered. And we're just going to do these as a kind of uh, synopsis of where we've been. If you remember when we looked at embedded systems, we talked about, in my opinion, the place to start when you're trying to debug an embedded system. In other words, you have a design, maybe your design and maybe somebody else's, that you're trying to get it to work. And it's for some reason, it's not quite working. So where do you start? Well, I've always found it most useful to start with the power and verify the power, then to verify the timing. After that, to look at the signals, then to verify that the data you're getting is correct. And the difference between signals and data is signals have to do with the electrical characteristics. Data has to do with the information content. So, for example, a 5-volt TTL signal is uh, would fall in this category, but a group of TTL signals making up a parallel bus having an ASCII character on that parallel bus, I would uh, call data. So after verifying that your data largely is correct, and by, by that what I mean is that you don't have a uh, a line in a bus that's stuck at a particular value. You don't have any runt pulses that are half as high or half as wide as they should be and things like that. And then finally you uh, try to verify the overall system. We have not talked about, though they are very important, issues like safety, thermal management, and electromagnetic interference. I thought it might be of some interest to take a look at the first real embedded system that I worked on. This is a photo of a Motorola evaluation kit. Slide it up so you can see the, uh, the name on it. As you see, it's the Microprocessor Systems Engineering Europe. And this particular board is called the uh, MEK6800. I'm not sure if that's written on here anywhere. But the, the processor was a Motorola 6800. Now this is the first true embedded system I ever worked on. And obviously I, I wasn't the designer of this. This came from Motorola, but we used this board in some very early systems back in the 1970s for uh, uh, actually a variety of things including uh, an early navigation system. Prior to GPS there was a system called LORAN, L-O-R-A-N, that was for long-range navigation that was used and one of the problems with LORAN was that you got raw data that told you where where you were. But if you wanted to know where you've been and uh, 
in other words, if you wanted to actually manipulate that data, you needed some kind of processor, and this was the uh, the board that we used initially. Now, obviously, there. The embedded systems have come a long way since this, and prior to this, there are other systems that I worked with that had computers in them. I started out with the Intel 4004, which I think was the first uh, microprocessor. The It worked in a calculator, not this one. This is an early, but not the earliest calculator. The earliest calculators that used the 4004 only did four functions, add, subtract, multiply, and divide. By the time the TI-30 came along, the, the processors being used were more advanced, and obviously the functions were a good deal uh, more involved. So let's take a look at what are the sorts of things that, uh, that you might be able to use this oscilloscope on as a kind of, uh, if you will, central theme to sort of wrap up this whole video series. I'm mostly going to focus on use of the trigger and measurement capabilities of the uh, Regal MSO 5000. And understand that there are videos on each of these topics uh, in my series. There also are some on the Regal website. Uh, some of those are repeated on the Sailing website and lots of lots of resources. We talked about looking at power and also looking at ground. Generally, when you're looking at power and ground, you're interested in the DC, that is the difference between the steady state value of the power bus and the ground bus or reference bus, plus any AC that is on top of that DC value. Now, often the AC consists of two components. One is what's called ripple, which is usually at the line frequency. If you're running this off a 60 or 50 cycle uh, line, then this would be at 50 or 60 cycles, or maybe a multiple of that, perhaps 120 cycles in the case of a 60 cycle system. But the things that tend to cause the most trouble are the noise spikes. And those spikes are normally at a very high frequency relative to the line. I have found it useful to use the bandwidth of the scope. That is, you can use a wide bandwidth for the high frequencies. Then you can restrict the bandwidth to look for the lower frequency signals. Uh, oscilloscopes, including the, the MSO 5000, contain filters that uh, can do things like high and low pass filtering uh, that can be useful in eliminating signals from consideration. For example, when trying to get a stable trigger, sometimes it's a good idea to filter unwanted signals out. The last thing that you may find useful is to use the fast Fourier transform function to actually look at the frequency spectrum because that will a lot of times give you a clue as to where these noise spikes are coming from. Now, when you're doing this, I encourage you to keep in mind some of these uh, rules of thumb that we talked about under debugging tips. Fast rise time means that there's a lot of high frequency component and with high frequency signals, or another way to say it is with a fast rise time, you have to use a high speed probe. A 10x probe is uh, pretty much a, a minimum, it has to be compensated, and you may want to actually consider using a high frequency differential probe, though those are pretty expensive. When you're looking at power, we talked about looking at the quality by using a small test loop. What we're talking about there is on the probe often is a little ground lead of this sort that you hook to ground and then you hook the probe to the, your test point. Don't try to do this with high frequency signals. 
use the little short grounds that attach right out here at the end of the at the end of the probe and if you want to see more on that I uh, have a video on debugging tips but also you uh, you might want to look at some of the uh, probe videos by places like uh, Allen at W to AEW so uh, but make sure that you're actually looking at what at the signal you're not looking at the your test loop when you're looking for for timing you uh, timing generally consists of two things one is jitter in other words uh, the the waveform doesn't rise or fall at the same place every cycle the other is relative timing between two signals, like uh, set up and hold times and, uh, and so on. And part of the reason is that jitter can, can change the timing, but if the basic timing is too, uh, too sensitive, that is too close to the, to the borderline, you'll get glitches and all sorts of other things. So make sure that your uh, timing works before you go looking for signal anomalies. And then when you're looking at signal anomalies, just remember that oftentimes signal pulses cause uh, power source uh, problems. And so back to what we were talking about here, if you're looking at noise on your power line, it may be that you have some kind of timing uh, difficulty in your system. And an FFT can sometimes give you some clues about that. So what are some of the things you, that an oscilloscope is good for? Well, for example, you can measure the period of a signal. This could be a clock signal or a data signal. And it's helpful to remember that statistics can be useful. For example, if you measure the period of a signal and you turn on statistics, it will tell you how much that signal varies from cycle to cycle. The uh, counter in the uh, MSO 5000 can also be a useful source of information. When you're looking at pulses, Remember that you have triggers that can that can be set up to look at particular pulse widths. But also remember that pulse triggering is not the same as pulse measurement. Triggers and measurement are two different things. They can work together, but they aren't the same thing. So be sure you understand the difference between, for example, using a pulse trigger and doing a pulse measurement. Another measurement that you might want to uh, pay attention to is the rise and fall times of your signals. Uh, these can be important not only because a, some, uh, in some cases a fast rise time can cause noise. In another case a slow rise time can cause oscillation because there, when, while the signal is rising at some point it passes through a transition region between 0 and 1 and some circuits will oscillate as they're passing through that that region so just be aware of that possibility then when you're dealing with signals that should be periodic but some of them are missing so for example here you're getting a pulse at this time and a pulse at this time but this pulse really should be over here. Well, a couple of the ways to look for that is by using the hold trigger, the duration trigger, and the timeout trigger. We talked about that in some of the earlier videos. The, the other area where signals can often be problematic is where you have uh, runs. Now, normally we talk about runs as something that doesn't meet the, the voltage levels for either a 0 or a 1, but is somewhere in between. But uh, sometimes people refer to a pulse that is supposed to be, suppose, for example, you take this, this uh, 
Suppose this is what you're supposed to see, but this is what you're actually seeing. Some people will call this a runt pulse because it is smaller in time than it's supposed to be. So just be aware of that if you're uh, communicating or reading reports by others that sometimes runt means two different things. And set up and hold times can, uh, can also cause problems in your logic. And we talked about that in, uh, in some earlier videos. So let's take a look at, the, at what we've done. And in case you missed any of these videos and want to go back, the, uh, some of them that I consider the most important are the videos on triggering, and on serial buses math and measurement because those are the ones that you'll find you use the most at least in my experience a lot of these others have some uh, some uses but they're not used as frequently if you really understand how to use the triggering features of an oscilloscope how to set up a serial bus including the triggering and the decoding and also how to use the math and measurement functions to determine what the statistics are of your, uh, of your embedded system. You're more than 50% of the way there. The rest of the videos are either more specialized, like some of these latter ones on things like using a duration trigger, or they are uh, uh, generic uh, devices like search and navigation and recording playback that are very nice advanced features of an oscilloscope like the MSO 5000. So, in summary, when you're looking at an embedded system, and believe me, they're going to be a lot more complicated than the ones we were dealing with uh, 50 years ago or so, the uh, they can be very complex, but if you can break your problem down into its symptoms, focus on those symptoms, and if you understand how to use a good oscilloscope like the MSO 5000, I'm sure that you'll uh, be able to find the problems, fix them, and get your embedded system into operation for hopefully many years of successful service. As I said, this is going to be the last video in this series. I hope you've enjoyed all of them, but if you've missed a few, you might be encouraged to go back and look at some, or you might be encouraged to go look at some of the other channels like uh, Keysight or the, the Regal channel, the Salig channel, and so on because they also have some really good videos that will be of interest. If all you've gotten out of this is a little entertainment value, well that too is, uh, means that we've accomplished something. But more importantly, if you have learned some new tricks, some new ideas, some new ways of looking at problems, then I feel like we've made giant steps. Thank you for watching. I'll be moving on to some other subjects, but stay safe and have a nice day.